Hey folks, welcome into the Gridiron Show as we enter Super Bowl week. Uh, hard to believe. Uh, it's it's a really, really interesting week. Obviously, it's going to be interesting because it's a Super Bowl, but there's so many different storylines with the Super Bowl. You've got the Eagles going up against the Chiefs. You've got George Karlaftis with the Greek element for Europeans on the Chiefs side. But you've also got a guy um, that is playing, and he's from Australia, and his his background for the Eagles, Jordan, Jordan Malala, is is just fantastic but but before we even talk about Jordan I'm really really pumped and excited to chat to a guy I've been watching a lot of his content this year uh, at certain times during the day with the time difference uh, f- delighted to, to to just to be joined by Laurie Horse from the from ESPN Australia obviously the uh, the ho- co-host or star of the NFL Brecky show and I would tell you now Laurie obviously firstly welcome but f- for anybody that watches the NFL and obviously speaks English whether it's your first or second language Definitely check it out because it's it's really interesting to see the growth of Australia down under. Man, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on. That's all too flattering. I'm definitely going to go with co-host, not star, there because uh, my co-host Phil Murphy certainly brings uh, plenty of star potential on our NFL Brecky show. But it, it, it's great fun. Um, it's as you mentioned that the sport's growing down here. It has been on an upward trajectory for a while. Obviously, we've got a pretty strong heritage when it comes to punters. Um, something that wouldn't be unfamiliar to our European friends over there rugby loving and Gaelic football loving and rugby league loving uh, fans that might be over on, on the continent, not on the aisles there. But um, no, it's uh, it's been good fun to be involved um, in NFL coverage for a number of years now. And um, yeah, anyone out there, hopefully, uh, whether it's breakfast when you're watching, dinner, afternoon tea, uh, little lunchtime, um, any English speaking fans out there, I hope you enjoy. Let's let's talk about Australia and stuff for a start. Like, do you know when I when I was setting up this call, Laurie, and when I actually started researching the the game in Australia, and I couldn't get over how many players there actually are, you know, that that, that are either active or have been active in the league, um, over the last ten years, shall we say? And you know, obviously you've got, um, Jordan Malala, who, who we're going to talk about in a second. You've obviously got, uh, I I can't pronounce the punter's name, Aaron Sipos. <laughs> I've got that completely Aaron wrong. Yeah, Aaron Zipos. Yeah, I've got, and, yeah, and he's got coming. Like, it looks like he's coming back this week as well, which is incredible. Yeah, they activated his twenty-one day uh, window to return from injured reserve, and I think uh, the punting that they got out of Brett Kern in the previous game uh, might have facilitated that, or uh, hastened that, or made that decision perhaps a little easier for the Eagles front office and the coaching staff. Uh, but yeah, it looks the, the signs are starting to look good that we'll see Aaron Zipos, so two active Australians, um, on. Game day for the Philadelphia Eagles. And there's also another, there's Matt Leo, um, who's a defensive lineman, um, played college football at Iowa State, uh, who's been on the practice squad through the International Player Pathway program as well. So three Aussies represented there, and they've had so many over the years. You know, Cam Johnston was there not long ago. Uh, plenty of other punters have come through. And for the for the playoffs in general, you know, this was a record for Australia. We had six um, Aussies in the playoffs, and notably three of them were positional players. Um, Daniel Farlele, uh, whilst not having a starting role with the Baltimore Ravens, um, is a rookie down there. Um, the largest, uh, the largest prospect in the NFL draft that he came through, which was much, much hyped. Um, Adam Gotsis with the Jacksonville Jaguars, and then Mitch Wisniewski and uh, punting for the San Francisco 49ers, and and Michael Dixon, um, who's been one of the best punters in the league since he entered out of the University of Texas with the Seattle Seahawks as well. So having that number of Aussies there in the playoffs at the business end was a great storyline and equally seeing that now we had an even split between our traditional punting stronghold. Um, you think of the guys that come through the Pro Kick Australia program here, which is one of the one of the great, if not the greatest punting pipeline um, in the in the game across the world, um, matched with three positional players. It's a it's a sign of things to come. I'll, we'll we'll talk about Australia and the NFL towards the end because I'd love to get your viewpoint on that because I'm, I'm very passionate and I think obviously every fan is and analyst is outside of the US in terms of growing it to that next level. And um, Jordan, I I cannot believe Jordan's journey to the NFL. Now it's one thing, the situation in which he didn't have any real experience of the sport, and we'll talk about that in a second. But you know he had he had heart problems growing up. He, he had he had to get that sorted out. And then the South Sydney coaching staff basically said to him that, you know, at the time that they don't, they didn't think that he'd be like, what, physically able to keep up with the pace. And that, that's a rugby league. Um, so to think for a start, you know, when he's being told to, quote, play a sport that appreciates his size, I guess it was good advice that he's now, you know, in the NFL. But you know, this lad has been, I wouldn't say knocked, but he's faced a number of challenges to 
to get to this point. And I think that is admirable for a start. I mean, his point of difference um, as a size, speed, kind of mass athlete, something that clearly um, prevented some challenges for him in the sports that we play locally. You know, rugby league is that 80 minute game. It is perpetual motion. There aren't the stoppages that you see in the NFL. And, you know, there is an ask of the bigger body players to be playing 40 minutes straight at times um, if the interchange doesn't work their way. And that was something that, you know, I think he felt and, and you know, those that watched the game, you saw it was a it was a, a hurdle and an impediment. And whether he believed that that was a limitation or not, that's clearly something that, that proved an impediment for his rugby league career. But it's that point of difference that made him so appealing. I mean, to be, to, to, to come in at, you know, 350 pounds and, 346 I think was the initial measurement uh, when he first made the move over there and and you know stepping over there you, you expect so many offensive linemen around that 6465 mark and he's towering above that and then the the body fat percentage the way he carries it as someone you know who was over there on draft day on day three when he was picked by the Eagles and who was the beneficiary of one of many bear hugs that he was handing out after he was picked I can confirm that it's a fierce and ferocious level of contact there's not a lot of wasted um uh there's not a lot of wasted mass on the incredible athlete that he is so i think those raw tools are something the overcoming adversity is, is probably what paved and, and overcoming those obstacles is probably what paved what came next which was discipline um and, and a real focus uh, and a real ability to to dig in and pick up a playbook which as we know being international um, the fans or viewers or pundits or media members or whatever it is um, looking at the NFL, we know that that playbook is is one of the big challenges for anyone making the move. But every time you spoke to him along the way, and I was lucky enough to speak to him um, over the past kind of four or five years a few times um, in person and over Zoom calls and all that kind of stuff, the, the willingness to dive in um, and throw himself into the book and understand that this was just going to be this was going to be something unique um, from a sports slash uh, intellectual standpoint. Um, and the, he, he kept repeating the same kind of phrase, which is you just, you throw yourself in, you don't dip your toes, you throw yourself in and you learn to swim. Um, Cause that's your only option. Um, recently speaking to him, he added a different uh, speaking to him this season. He added a different, um, whether you want to call it an idiom or a phrase or whatever. And he said, you know, when, you know, when you're walking down the tunnel um, there's uh, and you see a light coming your way, uh, it's a freight train. Uh, it's just another freight train coming. You've got to learn to adapt, get out of the way and move forward because uh, there's always something coming at you. So I think that speaks to the mentality that he took to the challenge, working with the likes of Jeff Stoutland and the Eagles, the offensive line coach there who he praises continuously to match the obvious and rare physical skill set that he brought to it all. It's funny because you know he's he obviously came into the league and he still faced challenges, but you know, obviously going going from Australia to, to to the US and picking up a game, but obviously picking up a playbook in in this period of time is one thing. I was watching the the Niners game last weekend, and look, we all know how good that Eagles run game is. It's it's incredible, and I can't wait to see it uh, coming up in the Super Bowl uh, on the twelfth of February. There was that one play where I think it was Javon Kinlaw, and he was just <laughs> Jordan just completely made sure, like, nope. Absolutely not. He, he's just, he's so unique. And I guess, you know, that's why he is one of the highest, if not the highest graded offensive lineman this postseason. Have you been surprised at how quick he's been able to to adapt to the league in the sense of, you know, you've got people playing it from a young age, uh, whether it's in, in, in lower school or high school. Uh, it's, it's funny, isn't it? I think the fact that he has picked it up, I don't want that to kind of overshadow just how, massive a challenge it is for other people you know who are new to watching the nfl or um are trying to gauge an understanding why don't more athletes um uh, make this changeover i mean jordan said himself that there's been times throughout the years you know before he kind of had that that season where he started to get some opportunities um to get some playing snaps a couple of years ago and it started to build momentum and obviously since then he's become a franchise left tackle and a well-paid left tackle and has one of those deals that puts himself, you know, we're talking generational wealth at $64 million as the baseline for the four years, escalating up towards $80 million. But he said even up until that point, um, the frustration was there with him. It was something he was constantly battling because you don't have those innate football instincts, that history, that the muscle memory that is built through playing since you, you know, I don't know how young they start over in the States with the flag football at five, six, seven, eight years old, whatever it is. But um, I guess that 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 points to a, a rare aptitude um, and and, um, and kind of appetite 
uh, for the challenge, for the mental challenge to go with the physical. And, you know, as you know, being uh, being someone over in Europe who's, who's been surrounded by contact sport, obviously contact and the, the, the tenacity and the collisions and stuff of the sport is not something foreign to him. And you hear him talk about it as as softly spoken, as sweet a man as he is off the field. Um, you hear when he talks about the switch going off or he talks about the mentality he takes to the field, that is something that was very, very much in a, the desire to to dominate that matchup, the desire to open that crease in the run game, the desire to stall that pass rush, the desire to get out on a, you know, on a convoy move with Jason Kelsey and just annihilate, you know, some poor linebacker or defensive back um, and and leave them turning their head and going, well, there goes the touchdown run. That's something that I think clearly spoke to him on a very, very core and natural uh, basis from the get go. Let's, Let's look at this. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Jesse Williams, um, who was a defensive and defensive tackle for Seattle, he won a ring uh, as an Australian. I think I think it was the first to do it, but he was injured all season, so didn't actually play a down or anything in that sense. You've got two players now on the Eagles squad. Obviously, as you've mentioned there as well, um, guy on the practice squad as well. So if they win next week, it could be the first, you know, the first players to be active players in the NFL to to be Australian Super Bowl winners. What do you think that would do for, for I guess, for, for NFL fans in Australia, future maybe NFL player? I think it would be huge, wouldn't it, to see that happen? It just elevates the cut through. You know, if you're an NFL fan in Australia or you've been following Jordan Mailata's story on any level, you're aware of him. I, you know, had a look at where Australian athletes were in the in the world coming into this NFL season or early in the NFL season, um, you know, across different, you know, different sports, different codes, men's sport, women's sport, and where Jordan Mailata really came down. And I personally had him as a top three Australian athlete in the world, given where we were. You talk about the Alexander Volkanovskis in the MMA UFC world. You talk about uh, Sam Kerr um, in um, in football, who's you know one of the uh, best women footballers in the world. And, um, and you know, ask the fans of her um, for the club and national level should be a Ballon d'Or winner um, in, in the women's game. Um, and some of our Olympians, you know, particularly in the women's swimming, we've had some of late, some stellar, stellar athletes. And, but, and my lighter doesn't get that level of experience with a traditional fan base in Australia. But a Super Bowl cuts through so much. As the Super Bowl has become more and more popular for fans, more and more people taking the Monday off, more and more corporate um, events happening on the Monday, taking it off isn't it? Taking it off on the Monday, taking work off isn't this niche thing anymore. It is so common. Um, you know, it's starting to get pretty expensive to find yourself a place to go watch the game at 10.30 in the morning on a Monday, um, which is a good thing. But as as that has increased, um, something like the Super Bowl, um, that primacy, that event, um, to have the images of him with a Super Bowl championship ring would certainly provide just a next level of cut through. And it would it kind of cement to people who may have heard little bits and things about this Mylata guy over there, this Jordan guy might not know his last name, doing things, it really does kind of put it in very shiny diamond font um, for them, what he's achieved. And then you look at, you mentioned what it means for the next slot. Um, You know, Aaron Sipos is part of that Pro Kick Australia punting pipeline, but you're starting to look at, you know, Daniel Farley, they came into the league. We're seeing three more players from the region, from Australia and New Zealand, um, a part of the next crop um, of pipelines, international player path, international player, pathway program um, athletes that have gone over to IMG Academy in Florida. Um, and we'll see how they progress to that stage. And you're looking at the likes of Thomas Yasmin, a, a, an amazing athlete who's playing tight end for Utah, who broke out towards the end of the season, half a dozen touchdowns, caught a touchdown at the Rose Bowl, um, runs a 44940 at 240, 250 pounds, former schoolboy star in Australian rugby, playing at one of the prestigious, prestigious uh, rugby kind of juggernauts in Australia. Uh, particularly in Sydney, New South Wales, where I'm from, that's starting to flow down. You're starting to see more and more have a crack. And the important thing is it's more and more having it go younger. Jordan wasn't 25, 26 when he came over. He is only 25 now. He's entering his age 26 season next year. They're coming over and they're looking at this transition at 16, at 17, at 18, 19, 20, when the, the careers are so far ahead of them. But that football memory, you know, we all know as we get older, our brain becomes <laughs> a little less... Um, a little less agile and absorbable to new information. We get stuck in our ways. And that can be a certain, for, for athletes to get to 25, 26, 27, that can be the case as well, whereas these guys are coming in and looking at that process at a younger stage. And, I mean, that can only bode well for a, a country that certainly has a lot of athletes, certainly has a lot of athletic talent per capita, 
um, and then throw in the fact that there are there's not plenty of other Jordan. There's not Jordan, Jordan Mailata on every corner of the street in Sydney. I'm not going to say that, but there are plenty of athletes that do look around and go, "Have I been sized out of my sport for somewhere and uh, one reason or another? Have, is my profile not fit where the game is going? Could this be an opportunity to put my size, athleticism, explosion, perhaps, um, into a more specified role? Really open up some opportunities for me." It's 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 a really interesting time, and this goes into my last question. Obviously, I think Charlotte Offord now is the GM of NFL Australia. You see a big push. Uh, definitely, I've seen a big push personally to what's going on in Australia, and you've sort of already answered the question I had previously. It's a very different experience for just for you, because obviously it's like a Monday morning thing. I could I couldn't imagine that. So fair, fair play to you, mate. Um, but look, I like. I mean, like it's great to have the games in the UK and games in Germany. Could we see a game in? Australia, because like I've seen <laughs> UFC events happen early in the morning for to to work around time things. So surely we couldn't put it out of the question. It may be a while away because you need to develop it, but surely we can see it because you've got the international home marketing agreements with teams, and hopefully it could happen because I, I think it would be awesome. I think the question is going to keep being asked. I think when you look at the competitive balance of an NFL regular season and what that travel would mean, um, you know that is the fourteen hour flight from. The West Coast is no joke. Then you're talking about what if this team is coming from the middle of the state or the East Coast for, you know, Philadelphia Eagles aren't internet. You know, they do have um, that kind of international marketing presence in Australia, them and the Rams, but the Philadelphia Eagles are not a West Coast team. There is an added flight there. How that impacts. People have talked about preseason games as well, but you think about a preseason is such a crucial time. We're doing roster cuts. People are playing for their absolute lives, their, their careers, I should say, their NFL lives, their careers. And they're putting it all in line and you're going to throw in concepts of jet lag and travel and passports into all that. It's difficult. But I think that question is going to keep being asked as the numbers increase in the viewership increase, the Australian presence increase, it's going to be asked. Maybe it's an exhibition game. Maybe who knows um, what type of concept they may come up with, um, whether that's off season, pre season, the question will be asked. Fans down here will continue asking it. The practicality of it, just knowing how, how tightly teams guard home games, how tightly they guard, you know, their, their routines, their travel itineraries, you know, what they do in Europe is fantastic. Seeing what we saw this year in, in Germany with traditional football style chanting yeah, that was in the middle of a play. It um, was it, the best experience. It was better for a better experience for me than so far last year. Well, I loved it. It was incredible. Honestly. It, it really was something rare. It was, and seeing, seeing European and international fans take pride in that, football like i'm talking football soccer football fans taking pride in that and then americans and their response to it as well it was such a unique meeting of it, it was the perfect type of cultural clash um we could see something that you know down in australia if it was at you know we've got you know, massive stadiums across the, the most famous ones people will think of the mcg uh the scg here where we saw you know nick scott the ram safety was down here before the season and having a look at the the ornate um, kind of stands and, and architecture around a Sydney cricket ground. Um, we've obviously got the big, you know, the massive Olympic stadiums that change names every year that, you know, host 80,000 plus Suncorp, the fortress up in Brisbane, where we would like to host the All Blacks most of the time. Um, that type of environment, yeah, it'd be fantastic. Whether the NFL would look at the practicality of it and sign off it, who knows? But I can guarantee that Australian NFL fans, as they keep growing in number, are going to continue asking that question. Look, if it gives me an excuse to go to Australia for the first time, I'll I'll definitely do it. But I, I really wish you the very, very best because I know there's an awful lot of work being put in um, from the NFL with the Australian market. You've now seen, obviously, the emergence. There's a demand there. The players are there. Um, and obviously, Laurie, if, if anybody wants to follow you, they can on Twitter. I, I will link it into the bio here and, and just literally type in Laurie Horish and ESPN NFL Bracky Show. I'm, I look forward to watching it from uh, Phoenix Airport on Tuesday morning. Uh, my time, I think it's going to be, or Monday morning. Um, Laurie, just obviously, um, thanks very much for taking the time because I know it's a busy, busy couple of weeks and uh, we'll definitely do this again. Mate. Thanks so much. It was an absolute pleasure. Happy to come on any time and uh, enjoy your time over there. I'm immensely, immensely jealous, but very happy that you make the trip. I'll see you next year in Vegas, please, God. And uh, Chatty Sinori, thanks so much. Thanks.